Okay. And recording. 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 Before we start, yes, sir. I gotta get my good luck juice, my good luck spray. It smells good in here. There you go. Good luck. My good luck juice. Good luck juice. <laughs> out of a out of a new bottle. It now goes back to its old home. Its new home. Sorry. But I did get the first squirt out of it. But wait, we should have a moment here of silence because you finally received your wish, right? Yes. Yes. This is. That's beautiful. I said off camera that. I'm very touched with you doing this. This, oh is, this was so, the one that's touched. so amazing. This, this juice is amazing. It is just... This whole experience has been amazing. an incredible yeah. memory. Yeah, and you thank know. you, for one, not just for bringing this, but just for coming in. This is awesome. It, it, it was really neat to have you come into our small town. And uh, our population, for you guys who don't know, uh, we're about 93,000 people. So it's not like we're in Chicago or Detroit or... You know, Any you major city and people, you came into Lawton, Oklahoma. You know, I don't look at it as this could have been a town of three, but there's something about the two of you that's very um, warm, and and it, I'm intrigued when I was when I first came across the channel. <laughs> so for those of you, uh, just so we can start, is um, I'm in Lawton, Oklahoma, yes, and I'm here with uh, with James from Outlaw Fragrances and Russell. Is what would you say? Russell is is with Outlaw Fragrances. Yes, but you're the founder. You're the founding father, right? And the yeah. two of you now are creating this channel together because, from what you told me, and we'll get to we'll get to that in a moment. But you guys were living in the same town unknowingly that you guys loved fragrances. Yeah. I mean, what right. are the odds? It's 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 kismet. Right. I actually found his channel. Yeah, because I will say it's it's. What are the, the odds of that? Right. Very, very slim because I, I moved here from Phoenix, which is a huge city. Right. And the whole time I lived there, I didn't come across another fraghead. So when right when I met him, it was kind of like, this is going to sound a little, but it was like a, 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 a sign from God. Right. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's meant to happen. It's kismet. It's, that's what they call it, kismet, when there's a spark in the universe yeah. that brings people together. Right. And I feel that. And so before we talk about, we're going to jump ahead. So what I wanted to do was, is I, I'm certain, I, I'm only, I'm new to the men's fragrance, the FragCon community online. And I never would have thought that this community would have so much depth to it. And, and the value that you got, that you, the entire FragCon bring to the industry, I don't think that you all realize it. Of it because that's a whole different mind, but it's like it's like running for crumbs when there's a big loaf of bread. Everyone's trying to, and so it's maybe like crumb it up. maybe now with my voice, it starts to change things in 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 your guys' heads to see actually from a different perspective of the industry. So I decide I'm watching you guys, and I and I and I know that the rest of your subscribers and your fans are looking at this and saying, okay, what are they all about? Is he, you know, do you, what's your story? What does he do in, you know, in IRL, in real life? And right. how did he get to this? And so I decided that you guys spent all your time reviewing other, telling other people's story that why don't I turn it around and review the reviewer, but not review, but reveal the, the, the review. I like that. Reveal, reveal the, the reviewer. reviewer. I yes. like that too. Yeah, that's catchy. And so we just started I would, that. Right, and to create a series <laughs> where you're just talking and asking questions. I'm talking too much, but I wanted to tell the intro. Yeah. Right. So here I am. It. Just the, why I'm here and what we're doing. So right. this is about the two of you and more or less about your life and uh, your everyday life and how it connects to Outlaw Fragrances. So let's start with James and... James and Russell, and so just where were you guys born, each of you? Uh, mine's an incredibly long story, so go ahead. Well, what city were you born in? What, I was Detroit, from, Michigan is where I was born. You're from Detroit and yourself? I'm from, I was born in uh, Floodwood, Minnesota, the home of Judy Garland. Awesome, really? Yeah. So there you go. So Judy Garland was from where? From Floodwood, Minnesota. Flitwood? Floodwood. Floodwood, okay. Which Floodwood. is a super tiny little town in the middle of nowhere, Minnesota. Where, like, where, whereabouts in Minnesota? Um, like, is it towards Wisconsin? Is it towards no, the Dakotas? Is it south? It's actually up by the Iron Range. It's actually in the Iron Range, which, if you live there, they 
mine tagonite there, which they turn into steel oh, that's awesome. and iron. Okay. But that's where it's located. So it has to be a small. It has to be a small town. Yeah, it's super small. Okay. So and then what? What happened? You all right? So you're there. You went to high school. You went to grammar school. You went to grammar school in Detroit, and then no. So you. My folks were. My mom and dad had a gypsy virus, because I have my. From kindergarten to 12th grade, I think I went to 14 different schools. Mm -hmm. So my parents moved once a year, every year, no matter what. So it was always kind of interesting. When I finally moved out of my parents' house, I was 16 because I was tired of packing up and moving my parents. So what, what did your father do that made your mother do? What were they doing that they were moving around? Were they just pick up and leave once they would settle? They needed the chaos of moving around? I think my dad was always looking for the next bigger, better deal. Okay. Cause, uh, Respect, right. Yeah, because yeah. my dad had a lot of ties into um, the agricultural world. Like, I grew up on a quarter rose ranch, for the most part, in the mountains of Colorado mm -hmm. by a town called Craig. So my dad was always looking for more land that he could rent, wow. you know, mm -hmm. something that would actually improve the quality of, what life they were chasing right you know so my dad was constantly if he found something that he thought was better than where we were at we moved no matter what your father you just lost him this year right last year on father's last day last year father's day 2018 was it in the the, the town that you was in a different town no nah, because my dad and mom were carried that whole moving around okay. thing forever he had passed away in a little tiny town called bristol south dakota All right. and bristol has Less than 300 people in for the whole population. And, and plus the dogs and the cats. Dogs, the chickens, the everything is less than 300. So you're in, you are in now Detroit City, or are you, Russell, in the the suburbs? No, Detroit. Okay. I mean, we were born and raised in Detroit, Detroit. Um, we didn't move out of Detroit until high school. Okay, you're, how many kids in your family? Uh, we have, I've got one brother, one sister. So. And you're number where? I'm the middle. You're the middle child? I'm the middle child. And yourself, you have a brother? Um, I have three brothers and four sisters. Oh, and you're what number? I'm the second to the last. Okay, so you're like the baby, the second baby to the last, right? Yeah. Then I have a little brother that's 13 months to the day younger than me. Oh, wow. Like my sister, same thing. Uh, a couple days more. All right, so you're in Detroit. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Up until then, you're 16 years old, so... Wow. That was just going to school. You finished at, high school there? High school. We had moved out. Um, I was 14 when we moved out of Detroit. And we moved to a little town, a suburb called Berkeley. Okay. So uh, that's where I started high school and went through high school there in Berkeley. And then um, that would bring us all the way up to like 1990 mm -hmm. when the Gulf War and stuff kicked off and I joined the military. So you joined the military in Detroit? Mm hmm from and, Detroit. And now you went into the military was after 16 or what, what happened after you said that you finished high school? Yeah, I finished high school and then it's kind of the same story. I, from high school, I was trying to take a look at what my options were as a young man mm -hmm. and the military was really, I'm from a military based family. Mm -hmm. um, it just seemed like the right thing to do and it really was. The things that I learned and the places that I went and the experiences that I had the only thing that would have been able to facilitate that is the time that I spent in the army. That's pretty awesome. I think everyone should tra travel. Everyone should leave the country. Because I went in in 88 and got out in 94. Oh, wow. So that's that's five, six years? I spent six, six years. Six years. And you made it a career, right? Yes, I did 21 years. 21 years. Yeah. And so, so now you're in the military. Uh, where were you stationed at when you were doing your thing? Um, all over, all over? The, all over the place. Yeah. yeah, which which division? I was in telecom or communication. I was at twenty nine mic, so I did microwave and satellite repair. Is that the army, the navy? Or the I was what? in the army. You were in the army, and yourself? So you were in the signal corps. Yeah. So it's called the signal corps, yeah, and that's what he does com, communication, corps. right? And I was ordnance. Um, I was a mechanic. Okay. So a light wheel vehicle mechanic, and then as you progress, you just go up. From being a mechanic to then you take over, you know, the motor pool, you're a motor sergeant, and you kind of progress up that way. Oh, that's pretty cool. So when you, first of all, you see some insights. So that's why you love this so much is because you were doing it for, you've been doing this for a long time, right? Yeah, well, not so much the video aspect, but I've been in 
communication it, for, for account, right? yeah forever and then when i got out of the service i worked as an epm and engineering project manager so i worked for siemens ericsson nokia and i traveled all over the united states doing overlays i love it because when someone looks at you um they might they might tag you just because that's how we are we're visual we're visual beings we're born in the flesh and the mm -hmm. physical someone will look at you and say would never guess that you would be traveling the country doing with the big companies and and which is and hold on and that judgment is a disservice to them because you're nothing like that yeah my physical appearance and my actual i would say my personality yeah, or as two totally different things. I am nothing like I look. And I've even had people that I I've met. I think you look cool. I think you're you. cool. I think you're a cool I, guy. I, That's me, though. I love that. I, I enjoy see. it, too. I'm kind of stuck with it because it doesn't wash off. No. You know? Well, and, and one thing, looking at him, you would never envision him being into fragrance in the first place. Right. Yeah. You know, you're looking at a Stetson guy, and he's going to get on your bike, and you're going to go. And yeah. that's, that's what you would see. But... James gets so in depth with the notes and the breakdowns, and, and it just it drew him in. And, Unbelievable, you know. But looking at him, you're right that that gives a disservice to those people that are looking at him and make that prejudgment. Because and, I have had people after they got to know me say, you know, I quote, "You are nothing like what you look like." Right. You know, and I get that quite a bit. And to me, in the end, when somebody tells me that, it's a compliment to me. I take it as a compliment. Right. Well, it's more like you are nothing like what my brain, not because you look like, you act like what you look like. Like I look at you and you're just James. Yes. Right? And I don't connect it to something else. And that's a piece of from traveling. Notion. Yes, exactly. That you can't do that. You'll miss out on, on things. If you judge, you lock yourself off. Right. So, um, so you, you were told the fragrance. So I think what's awesome is that you have these men that are considered very butch, very, you know, I want to say the manly straight, men. yeah, manly men, mm -hmm. and that they're closet fragrance lovers. Yeah. And they're now looking at you and they're connecting with that masculine part where, you know, it's okay for me to like fragrances, which might be considered f female. Yeah, a little right? feminine. They're feminine, right. right? So now for yourself, so you're in the Army you're twenty for 21 years. Were you stationed or did you also move around? Uh, the Army moves you around. Hey, you have a choice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right? Germany, Korea, um, Iraq, Afghanistan, in, in the United States, Arizona. That's where mm -hmm. I met my wife was down there and she has, they have a family ranch there. And so that's when I retired for the second time planning on going down to Arizona. So, and that's where he just came from was Phoenix and I'm going to Arizona. Yeah, yeah. That's why I finish here. Well, I think that you got, you're both very young. And so I, I'm hoping that you retire maybe in 20 years when outlaw, outlaw fragrances has its own collection of everything, cigars, <laughs> fragrances, soaps. Uh, and so, so now you get married when I got married, um, yeah, bring it up, get in, the marriage, the kids, even if it's a In 1990, okay. uh, after graduating, and she was the high school Graduate sweetheart, high school. Okay. Um, we had a child, and his name was Alan. And then we first duty assignment was Germany. She got pregnant again with my son, Ronnie. Mm -hmm. And then we moved from there to Arizona uh, in 1995, and her and my oldest son died in a house fire. So oh, I was stuck with that. Ronnie, uh, not stuck with Ronnie. I don't want it to come off like that. It was just Ronnie and I then at that point. So you were left with a child. How old was Ronnie right. at the time? Two years old. I right, see so you were left with a child with no mother. Right. Mother and then he got some uh, brain injury from lack of oxygen. So we've been dealing with that. But I met my current wife in 1995. We dated for like eight and a half years and then got married. And she comes, she has already... Um, Two girls and one boy. So we became a six pack when the we put us family. all together as a blend. How old was Ronnie when you got married? Oh, he would have been 10, 11 at that point. So you waited 10, 10, nine eight, years, eight and a half years. years is what we dated him to Sorry to hear married. that. Wow. Wow. All right. It's interesting. You look at somebody and they say they all have a story, you know, and mm -hmm. I'm sorry you have to go through that. Well, it's just part of life, you know. So, so you're with Ronnie and all of a sudden you have an instant family of six. Mm -hmm. And so, where's that at? Where were you at that time when you got married? 
Uh, we were down in uh, Bisbee, Arizona. Arizona, uh -huh. and so we're roughly where uh, is Phoenix. Bis Bisbee is all the way down the southeast corner. I mean, you could see Mexico. Oh, yeah, you yeah. Mexico. Hello. Right. Maybe uh, so. And it's Fort Machuca. It was yeah. a military base. Fort Machuca. There. Uh -huh. So with you, when did you join? You joined the military at sixteen. You were there for eight years, right? So with me at eighteen, I went into the service after graduating high school because I wasn't an academic genius in high school by any means. I was your quintessential jock. I I finished school because of football. If it wasn't for football, I wouldn't have finished high school. I hope you end up like. If you're able to scan some pictures, I'd love to show your what you look like as a marine, what you look like in you know not marine in the army, army, just to show and to show like your your football, the jock, if you want to, because I would love to show. Yeah. So go ahead. I'm sorry. So you so you're playing football in high school. Yep. So after I graduated from high school, like I said, I was looking at the options that were available to me as a young man, and I came from a military kind of based family, and I made the decision that you know that would have been. It really was the best decision at that age of my life that I could have made. I've benefited from what I've learned from the military. Like, I'm I'm still like this. So you're either 10 minutes early or you're late. You know, this morning when I came and picked you right. up, you know, being on time, having a good work ethic, being able to follow directions, being able to give directions, all of those fundamental lessons the U.S. Army taught me. To function in society. Was, yeah, like a gentleman, right? Yeah, and like good manners, too. That, right? right. And then after that, I, I met my first wife right after I got out of basic training. She was in the service, too. My schooling was two years long. Okay. So we met, and I got married. She was 10 years older than me. I was 18. She was 28. She had two hey, kids. I love it. Cougar. Yeah. <laughs> Rocking the cradle. So, so you got married at 18. I got married it's at 18. very young. Yeah. Maybe that back then it was maybe so, so young. But when you look at it today's world and the kids that are 18 yeah, years old, it's just no be like, it's like, like, you don't get it now. They're so young. That, and I could really say at that point in my life, I really wanted to have a family. I okay. wanted to have... You know, I wanted to have kids. I, yeah. Stability. You wanted to create like a nest, right? Yeah. So you got married with six, with eight, total eight, uh, wait, six kids with you. It was yeah. eight in the family, right? Well, there's, there's mother no, there's a total of four kids and then with us too. Six total. They okay. made a total of six. Beautiful. My, six my family, I have four kids. So yeah, six of us. And then you had three, uh, four. Yeah, I you actually raised seven. Seven? Yeah, because my first wife had two when I married her. Okay. And then we had two together. I have my oldest daughter I had when I was 16, and then my second wife had two, and then I raised my nephew too. That's so that's incredible. seven kids total. And I feel that nurturing, and both of you guys have very nurturing uh, energy. Uh, you, you're nurturers. You want to you want to accommodate. You want to cultivate the relationship. You you want to accommodate the relationships, and I found that to be two very warm people, and so. It's interesting to hear your story. So now, so where are we at now? After the army, you've got your family. Now you have your family. Uh, you you had seven total, but you're looking at now maybe the four. Where did you go from that? Were you just doing the Siemens gig while you were having your family? And where did you live? You were so well, Siemens is so, a Navy term. That's yeah. No, I actually worked for a company Siemens called Siemens Company oh, out of oh, Germany. Okay. So my mind's in the middle. Of yeah. So it's like, no, no. I'm glad you clarified. Yeah. That. I would say that too. In case y'all didn't know, yeah. So after I got out of the service, I would say there was probably I worked for for Sharp Electronics in Memphis, Tennessee, because my first wife was from Memphis. Right. So I worked for them in the engineering department, and then when we moved from there to Phoenix, Arizona, is when I actually went to work for Siemens, which is an incredible company because it's a European-based company. So when you start there, at the very first day, you get 30 days vacation because they carry all of the European yeah, values, German. German values over. I don't know if they do it anymore, but back then they did. Because I can remember going through orientation and them telling us, you can take 30 days of vacation right now, but when you come back, you might not have a job. You know? Yeah, because they'll replace you. Yeah, because you can't start a new job and then take yeah, it. Take off. Take off. But uh, I did that for probably... 
six or eight years traveling all over the United States. Out of Memphis, States. right? Out of Memphis. No, I was in Phoenix at that point Phoenix, in time. Okay. Because at that point in time, me and my first wife had split and had divorced. All right. And I had met my second wife just about the time that I started doing that. So she would stay there in Phoenix with the kids. And then I traveled around like I was, I spent two years in Detroit, your hometown. I spent two years in Milwaukee. I worked in Portland, Oregon. Um, our offices were in Boca Raton, Florida. So I spent a ton of time there. I mean, you had I, to move all the family all over the no, world. It's just me. Just my, you and yeah. there was an anchor. My brother does that too. He yeah. stays in one place and travels from Monday to Friday as a consultant or a contractor. Yeah. So you're now where, where does this take us? You're married. You have your what family. Are we at? Well, you have, you get married and you have your family. Now there's six of you. Mm. Where are you at at that point? But you're still in the military, 21, so you're still in Arizona, right? Well, no. We got married, and I went to Korea for a year. Oh, you did? Okay. And then uh, I couldn't get stationed back at Fort Huachuca, and they said, they gave me a list and said, choose your spot. Choose your poison, if you will. And so I chose uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Here. Which is Lawton, Oklahoma. Okay. Yes. And so we moved the entire family here. So the, this, so this is now just so people who are watching. Lawton, Oklahoma is probably about an hour and a half drive to Oklahoma City. It's south, south of, it, of Oklahoma right? City. And then right. Tulsa is like three hours, four hours. Correct. Okay. About three hours. Just because I was fascinated when I was looking at the map. Correct. And there's a small little airport, and it's only served by American Airlines, and it's four, three, four flights a day from Dallas. That's it. Right. So it's a smaller airport, but a lot of military. Yeah. And so, military, so yeah. do they have the, the big military planes that if they're going to deploy, it comes into Lawton? Yeah, they, they would fly that they here. That? They, they do do that. Um, we have a Air Force base okay. to the uh, west of us, and it's called Altus. Okay. So we have, we, we have an Air Force base there. But, yes, they do fly out of here for the military flights and fly back in. We flew in and landed here both times. Okay, so you're now... You have your family, you're in Lawton, you're a career military guy, right, right with the Navy, Army. Army. And so now you're, where is our turning point? You're traveling, you have your family in one spot. So where, where is a turning point in your life with that? Um, What's the next cycle? Life cycle? My wife was complaining because I, the last year that I did it, I didn't get to come home at all. Okay. Um, I flew her out. I was in Milwaukee, as a matter of fact. I got to see my wife one time in an entire year. I flew her out at Christmas time. Wow. My wife was complaining about the fact that I was always gone. And she had a valid point. So I made really good money back then. Mm -hmm. So I saved up for a year and saved enough money. I came home and opened up my motorcycle shop in California. Where in California? In Sacramento. Sacramento? Actually in Carmichael, which is... In Sacramento. And so you would work, you would sell, or would you work on bikes? Would you, was it like a, like a car, you, uh, a new car? No, I actually or? built motorcycles from scratch. Like OCC? Yeah. Um, I did, the only thing you, you so couldn't awesome. have done in my shop is I didn't do upholstery work, but the upholstery guys were directly across the street. So you could bring me a stock bike and leave it with me and come back and pick up a complete custom motorcycle. That's so awesome. This is so awesome that I'm learning this. It's it's so cool. And I and I hope people take the time to listen to this because you guys are really awesome. So you have the bike shop in Sacramento. You're in Lawton. Your mm-hmm. kids, you're giving your kids a, a stable, right? To, to, right? You're not moving them around. Most of them most of them went to high school and graduated from here, from here. except for our oldest who did graduate from Bisbee down okay. in Arizona. In Arizona. Mm-hmm. So so you're doing your thing. You now, where's our turning point with with you? What what happens next? In 2011, well, after the housing bubble bursted, everybody I knew in California lost their house. Yeah. Everybody. It was, a, it was like a bloodbath. Yes. It was terrible. So when that happened, people didn't have the expendable cash to put on a toy. Because a motorcycle is it's a toy. Mm-hmm. Lost their so, item. Yeah. So I was able to stay afloat for two more years. I didn't close my doors until 2011. What, the nice thing about it is I didn't have any debt. Everything that I did with my business, if I couldn't pay for it cash, I didn't do it. So I had no associated debt when I closed my doors. I ran an apprenticeship program for pretty much the whole time I had the shop. That's one thing I really enjoyed doing. Apprentice, you were, yeah, you were taking younger, younger kids. 
Uh, grown ups, actually. Well, it's, oh, oh, anybody. Yeah, anybody. It's interesting because my man went to an apprenticeship equals young, but not necessarily the case. Yeah, no. Most of the guys that came in for the apprenticeship program were in their mid thirties. That's awesome. Okay, so you close up okay. in Sacramento, and you go where? Um, I go to um, the place I hate the most in the world, and that is. Um, my brother lived in Minnesota, and he lived in. Oh man, all of a sudden I can't remember the name. It's right next to Superior. You know where Lake Superior? Superior? Yeah. yeah. Well, there's actually in Wisconsin, there's a little teeny town called Superior, and mm -hmm. across the lake is the town in Minnesota that he lived. I can't okay. remember. But I ended up there because he would, he wanted me to move closer to him. And I, at that point in time, with everything that happened, I kind of wanted to be around family because my second wife had left me. When my money ran out, so did my second wife. So also, and imagine during that time, how many marriages crumbled as well. Yeah. Right? Money, money I've learned covers a lot. Yes. And so the moment it runs dry, it's it's like the water of, you know, draining a, a, a pond and all of a sudden you see all the all the stuff that people have thrown in there, the bikes are from nineteen twenties. And so that's what money. Money if if it goes down too low, you start seeing the problems that were covered. Right. People were you know, they look at the whatever they're going through and they'll say, Yeah, at least I have money, I'm secure, I have yeah. this, take that away. And it's like, you know what, I can't do this. And they tell women that there's a there's a channel on uh, YouTube where the woman goes, she's a, if they come from if the woman comes from if the girl comes from a wealthy family and she's paying for this guy and she said what you do is this tell them that your father quit your credit cards and you'll you'll either hear it's okay we'll manage or you'll say you better go to your father you tell him to turn that credit card on and so and so going back to your thing not your thing but in general money. Yeah. It was a tough time in that period. Yeah, so it she, really, really was. So where did she end up going? Now, did she take the kids with her? Well, she had two children from a previous right. relationship. So, yeah, she took the kids with her. That, I will say, was probably the bitterest pill because I loved it. They were my kids. Right. I still think of them as my kids. I still talk to them to this day. You know, my son is named Deontay. When he was little, he was scared of a shadow, and he's... I'm going to be really surprised if he doesn't end up in the NFL because he's played college ball for the last four years and he's a giant. I'm a big guy. He makes me look small. Really? Yeah. Is that right now? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. You you break any preconceived notions when someone meets you. Yeah. You're, you're, you're nothing like anyone would ever think of, except maybe a teddy bear because you're just so warm and, you know, and so. Gentle, gentle giant would be a gen good. I love that. A gentle good giant. Term for yes. Him. And, I, and I just, I'm so grateful to be here and talking to you guys. So where do you go then? So she leaves and you go where? Well, I went to... So with your superior, to with superior... Yeah, to in town. You got it, in Minnesota. And uh, it took me, it took me quite a long time to get over that oh, whole deal. Because I really, really, I worship my wife. I love my wife to death. So it took me a probably eight years to recover from that. Right, and then on top of the the business, on top of moving, on top of the marriage, you need time to, to get yourself your bearings back, right? Yeah. I always say that the one thing that holds us back is, is our brains. And so when we go through a hardship, I've learned that allow yourself to go through the motions of what you're going through to heal, but I always say to myself, your end result is to get your ass back out there. Mm -hmm. Stay in this space as as little time as you can with vigor and haste, knowing that you got to pull your ass out there and go back to living your life, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot of us carry. I have people still talking about their loss from two thousand eight. It's been it's been ten years, and they still lament about what they lost instead of thinking about what they can build or where they're going. Yeah, it or, took or what they get. Right? Yeah, it took and me a long it. time. Mm -hmm. To really be able, like, like I told you, I have the saying that when people ask me how I'm doing, I can, I can find something, no matter how small it is, to be grateful for. No matter what kind of situation I'm in, I can find something that I can focus on that's positive. You're so awesome. Because, you know, all of us are confronted every day with the hardships of life. And really, a, a happy life is... 10% of what happens to you and 90% of how do you react to it? That's your, your personal outlook. Yeah. Your perception and, and, reality. and where you get in station, you know, being military, um, wherever you're living, 
it is whatever you make it. Yes. I mean, literally, literally, you either sit in the barracks and it's the, the worst assignment in the world, or you go out and you experience the local, you know, customs and stuff like that, and you ingrain yourself. It's the best experience. That's every great. every duty station I've ever been in has always been the best. Yeah. I've always been in the best motor pool. I've always had the best people around me, and I've always enjoyed every single country because I didn't sit back and, and complain about it. I went out there and I wanted to learn. You want to sit down with the locals and, and just suck that in. So You know, you're right. And what I what I find a kindred spirit in you is that wherever we go, the part it's the party it's a party. Even if mm -hmm. we're all right. by ourselves, the party starts here. I, I just I see how he's more animated, but you're also that way too. I mean you don't just sit at your laurels, you go out there, you anyway, we I love it. You guys are so warm. <laughs> but one thing if I could mention is you had an accident, right? I just found out like maybe two, three hours ago when you told me. So what year, What happened with that? Are you talking about when the helicopter crash? Right. In Korea? Yeah, when I was stationed in Korea, I was in a really bad helicopter crash. So I was in an air deploy unit. So everywhere I went in a, in a comm van was picked up by a Black Hawk helicopter and then dropped on the top of a mountain. So when we were going through, you were there for Team Brisk, Team Spirit and Brisk Spirit, right? They still did that when you were in there. So I was on top of a mountain for 97 days. And once a week, they would come in and take us to go have a shower and bring us back. Every and 90 days? Every, every once a week. Once a week, you would yeah. shower. Okay, yeah. so well, you, you kind of get I used can't to the use the, the verbiage that we use, but you kind of do a, 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 a sponge bath. shift sponge bath yeah, for yeah, yourself. Right. So. So uh, one day, um, there's only one helicopter. Right. I just did that. Did you see me do that? <laughs> I went like this. Cuba. <laughs> so I was involved in a really bad helicopter crash there when one of the, an OH-58, which is the only helicopter in, in the Army that only requires one pilot. So you have one pilot and you have three seats for passengers. When it came off the helipad, it stood straight up around on his tail like this and auto rotated and then turned right back Jesus. around and landed on the top. Oh so I was really lucky. None of us got hurt. You know, I, I've got a, a couple things upstairs that I deal with from, right, from that. Right, so PTSD. Yeah. But other than that, I mean, I try to deal with it. I, I, I've, I'm always hyper alert. I mean, I, to me, it works. I try to make it work in my favor. Like I'm a bouncer. So all the things that a lot of guys have issues with, I kind of try to turn them around and make up a positive when it comes to that. And but, that's how I see you, by the way. It's by spending the time, the, the little time that we spend together, I see that. And I, you're a, a whole different energy. And we'll talk about that meaning in, in a good way. Um, you know, I had a friend of mine who there was a taka flight in uh, Tegucigalpa in uh, Honduras. And it has that, it's like the most dangerous runway in the world. And um, he, the plane was landing in the rain and it crashed. And he was able to escape from the crack of the plane. And he, all he had in his head was that moment. And I don't want to trigger anything in no. you, but he had that moment that he went through. I won't, I won't describe it because he was describing it to me. And he said, and the next day I go to work and it's like, I survived a plane crash and my brain is, really? is messed up and it's like world the world is does it is just going on and he said it, it destroyed his marriage, financially his business. Like he it took him a long time to get through it. So what you've been through, I would I mean I can't imagine of it you just doing your thing and all of a sudden it's this moment and that's where you're probably hypersensitive to because of that. Yeah, I well, <clears throat> or in general, in, in, and what in, you went through too. Yeah, just I think just the whole man. To be honest with you, I don't really know how to to verbalize it. Right. Okay. You know, um, things so, happen. Right. And, and I try to brain. Yeah, because so, I got whacked in the head pretty good, but I mean, and and a lot of people won't see it, but James shakes. He's He's, you know, um, but he still deals with it. And he tries, and I didn't mean to throw that no, out there, okay. but he, he hides like it. it very well. And, and um, but that's just something that you got to work through when you get that, right. you know, that injury. Because I, he said he, he uninjured, but it's not. 
a lot of military uh it's internal stuff yeah. that a lot of our soldiers that's why 22 if y'all don't know it 22 soldiers die a day from suicide and when it comes to the point that we're, we're, you're both in Lawton, okay and and your fragrance journey begins all gotcha. right and so you move to Lawton. why i came here for a couple of different reasons um i like i said i was living in phoenix arizona i went there from Arizona, from Minnesota to there, because my dear friend was going through a horrible divorce, and I wanted to be the friend that I wish I had. So when he needed help, I packed up my stuff and I went there. And we were roommates for three years. And then what prompted me to move here is just the cost of living in Arizona has gotten so out of hand. Like I couldn't afford this house where I'm right now would be probably over two grand a month in rent. And I just couldn't afford oh, to more. live. Yeah, or much, more. Oh my, much more. And this place is really dope. <laughs> what you've done with this place, it has a good energy. Um, it, very clean, very, very you, your style. Like right now, the lighting, like I, I look like a little, I look like an outlaw. Yeah. Outlaw <laughs> places, right? And the whole house looks like that. I think it's so appropriate. Oh, anyway, I can be gushing about all of you guys. So you're here and, and you're in Lawton. When did you retire from the military? Uh, I retired in 2011. Okay. So you have, a, okay. So when does the fragrance thing come into place? Hold on, I should do this. So you're 2011, you're still in the military. When was the, when was the last, when did you finish the military? In 2011, right? Yeah. You're done. And, and my f official retirement date is the official start date for the city here. Okay. Um, they just kind of happened to land on the same day. And so uh, I transferred into the city while I was waiting because I actually got hired to be a game warden up on post. A what? A game warden. A game post. warden. Right. Okay, so like people who go and illegally hunt? Yeah, like, that would right. be me chasing them. Right. 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 The poachers are, are just, you want to check in to go hunting and fishing, you check in with, right. with, it's called sportsman services. But I got stuck in a hiring freeze after I got the job. I put in my retirement paperwork. And uh, then I was sitting around for like 30 days, just kind of in a depressed mood. Like, right. what am I going to do? Well, hiring freeze in the military usually only lasts 90 days. And my wife's like, no, you got to go find a job. So I start flipping through and I said, hey, look, there's an animal welfare officer. It's like what I was doing up on post mm. and it's just dealing with dogs and cats instead of, instead of the animal. The game. The, what's the the wildlife, what's in this area? Right? You said there's buffalo? There's buffalo, there's elk, there's uh, deer, there's turkey, and there's phenomenal fishing here. Okay. Uh, we have That's a awesome. bunch of lakes, even though it used to be a dust bowl. We have lakes everywhere, right, right, and yeah. they're all stocked. With oh, that's interesting. Fish. The dust bowl was in Oklahoma, right? Mm -hmm. And went into a little bit into Iowa and in Nebraska, right? Mm -hmm. Is this any relation to the Fish and Wildlife, or is that the federal government? And you were at the state level, or are they tied together? Well, it's tied together because it's ran up on Fort Sill. Okay. It was, it's for the base is okay. where I was going Oh, perfect. Be. Okay. So, um, and that was actually my last, like, I don't know, six months, 12 months in was I was the NCOIC there, okay. stationed there. So and they NC said, they NC said, Hey, here's now a position. And I applied for it and I had gotten it. Cause NCOIC stands for non-commissioned officer, officer in charge. Okay. That's, that's interesting. You, so you go now into the welfare. What was it called back then? Are you talking about up on post or here? Whatever was next when you went into the, for the animal, for the dogs and cats, whatever. It was the uh, uh, Lawton Animal Control. Okay. Back then. And you, and we were talking once that you had mentioned that uh, when you came in, it was a high kill shelter, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was, we had a very high, um, well, it's kind of hard to explain a, a animal shelter without going into what high kill, um, low kill you know there's there's different tiers to it okay and so you really have to get into it but we were one of those they were they were they were they were considered a high yes kill, a high, they were a high a, 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 whatever Correct. category it was mm -hmm. a lot of that out of the hundred that would be there they would get they would put to sleep a big a big amount right, right. Yeah. was it more than the normal uh that or was it just is that normal in the united states um, it's very normal across the United okay. States to, for okay. most okay. open enrollment shelters, which means city ran and mm -hmm. you just take animals from everywhere to be like that. It's just the no kill movement and, and that which is coming up, uh, is kind of demanding a little bit higher and a little bit more. 
from every shelter, but it really wasn't even in the realm when I first got hired. Right. It was just, this is the way it was. And that's the way I was taught when I was coming into that. Because I want people watching this to really op open their eyes to what that, like you did to me. Like, I know it exists, but when you were when you were talking about it, it just made it real. Right. And the reason why I brought it up is because you made your presence, you whatever, at the time that you were there with everyone else, you made changes to, they all made, everyone made a conscious effort to change right. the high kill rate, right? Right, yeah. It, it went from like 85 out of 100 to we flipped it a 180 and we were getting out. There were several times I was over 90%. My yeah. highest was like 96.61%, and that's counting 100% of the animals, not just adoptable animals. That, that, that's incredible. And this is the whole, like you take care of the whole chunk of the state, Outside to uh, Texas, right? right? And then maybe Nebraska, where Oklahoma well, State. The furthest we've had was Kansas City, Kansas. Kansas. New Mexico. Is it born with Mexico, too? You come over to that part of Texas where there's that 80 that You're comes through. You're talking about the, pan, the panhandle. Right, there. right. So there's Oklahoma here on the east side, and on the west side is New Mexico, is it? Or no? What's... what's yeah, New Mexico. From, from Oklahoma is Colorado. It's Texas. Colorado, right? No, I mean, that's... You're talking... That's north... Northwest. North what, what borders west of Oklahoma? That's Texas, the panhandle of Texas. Oh, okay. But that little piece, because there's a little finger, right? Right, but you're talking that's northwest. That's way, way out okay. of... Good. I mean, when you're talking about when you're coming through Oklahoma, the farthest I've had was Kansas City, Kansas, okay. which is come all on. the way through Oklahoma. So that's they, huge. They brought to the us at, at one time. And I get phone calls from, like, Arkansas, which is to the right of us. Where people wanted to bring us, and we try and tell them, no, 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 this is, you know, it's too but far. Your, but your your welfare accommodates a big chunk of land, a big chunk portion of the country, right? right. But it's but actually, the it's actually, sorry, not the, the country, but the Midwest. It's actually just the city of Lawton. But after we started changing the perception, people started coming from awesome. all the places, from, and we we almost became the hub. Of southern Oklahoma. That's what you had said, the hub of southern so it, Oklahoma, yes. Yeah, we we became that, and and other shelters around the country started contacting us, wanting to try and emulate what we were doing, because we pretty much, I took the box and got rid of the box altogether, not, not even working inside the box, and we just started coming up with every kind of different program to implement to how do we save the most, and how so, do we get them all up. So when did you start wearing, when did you start becoming the, the, the character, um, I want to say not the character, but you know, you're very... Well, it's uh, kind of a character. Uh, very, an more animated, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I love that, I love theater. And so when did that come into place? Okay, so... What year are we at right now? Well, it's 2011. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take us to 2011 because that's when I joined the animal welfare team, right. which back then it was the dog pound. Um, and even like our ACOs, which I call an, or AWOs, animal welfare officers, which they're known as today, uh, would call each other dog catchers. And I'm like, you know, military fresh out of the military. I'm not doing that. Right. You know, we're animal welfare officers. It's like we're the animal control officers. In the 1940s with the Keystone cops and that, you know, the dog pound. That's right. And so it went from animal control officer to now animal welfare officer is where we're at today. But I did two years as an officer, and that's where I learned all the legal side, what I have to do to, to get a conviction, everything like that. Then the field supervisor retired, so I got promoted into the field supervisor position. We did that for a year, um, and then the citizens raised up, and they were they didn't want the shelter doing what it was ran the whole time. It's been running that way for 30 years. They were complaining we were just killing everything that walked in the door. Um, so during that transition, so I'm three years in now, they said, okay, we want you to come over, and now you take take the reins and uh we're under you know intense scrutiny here and it's like you know no matter who sits in that chair they're gonna be you know a target right and then, yeah it's you and so i, I kind of took it and so the buck stops with you is that what you're saying right. okay so so now i was the one and it took a little while but the transparency that i gave we started a facebook uh page lot animal welfare facebook page which, oh, so it's Lawton, L-A-W-T-O-N. Right, animal. Animal. And then welfare. Welfare on Facebook. Yeah, for the Facebook. And I now we just passed over 12,000. That's awesome. On, on a high kill shelters page, it's incredible. 
to see that kind of, of thing. But I was trying to put out everything we were trying to change. So we immediately lifted breed bands. There are certain breeds that people, you know, look at as dangerous. Your pit bulls, your Rottweilers, your Chows, your um, Doberman Pinchers. They already know out there what they would consider right. dangerous. No one over the age of six months old was allowed to be adopted out. So they were automatically euthanized. They were considered the not breeds, adoptable. The breeds, right? The certain breeds. The breeds. But you had said the pit bull is actually, you now bring it, you call it by its regular name. <coughs> the Sorry. correct name. The pit bull was a bull in the pit. So it was a slang and it became the pit bull. Now there's pit bull society, but the absolute correct name is American Staffshire Terrier. So we call them staffies. Staffies, got it. We call them staffies at our shelter just to take away that negative conversation. And you know that one one name is the difference between the dog dying, being put to sleep or not. It's amazing. Right. So we are what now? So what year are we at right now? Okay, so now we're at 2011. We did 12, 13, uh, end of 14, 15, July. July time frame in 2015 is when I started taking over. I told him I'll give him a year. Taking over the taking over the welfare. As, right. right, as a superintendent. And I said, I'll give you one year and I'll straighten it up. And then we got to go because her dad... My uh, wife's dad. Right. Casey, my wife's dad, her dad wasn't doing good health wise. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I'll give you one year. We're going to go from there. And so I did. We changed a lot. We got the public perception. We started doing an event called Two Hearts, where it's the first Saturday of every month. We reduced the adoption fee down to only $20. And I go, $20, $20, $20 to adopt any adoptable animal. And (laughs) Um, I love it. We started just not having that event, but we made it an event. We started bringing in people right. and we started, I mean, we had bounce That's houses incredible. and we've had all sorts of stuff. And the very first um, character, we'll say, event was Braveheart meets Two Hearts and we wore kilts. It was me and the assistant city manager at the time. He was very involved with me. So, I was dressed in a kilt. He was dressed in a kilt. We had stick horses and we had swords oh and we God. were like fighting each other, you know, and we would broadcast all of this on it, Facebook. It. Yeah, it's it's already on okay. Facebook and I'll I'll give you the pictures for it. But um and that's what started morphing and it pretty much grew to that's awesome. now I'm known here locally. If you want to call it Facebook famous, you know, that term yeah. thrown around a lot. That's me locally, but they're known for the crazy suits. I show up to different speaking events. Oh, but wear a crazy suit. And so that that persona they want, and they want to know what did we change? How are we doing today? So I publish our our monthly success rate to them every single month. And then every six months, I give a new report card. One for the calendar year, and then one for what's called a fiscal year. So... They get it two times a year. They get a big report card on how we're doing. And you're a force. You're a force of change. Like you're you you are out there making it happen. And, and I love that. And so we're now at 2014. When did when did you two uh, meet? Oh geez, what three months ago? Three it was months just ago. Three months ago. That quick, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, it was. It was. I was looking. Well, I guess I'll preference because you've been doing reviews for how long now? Your thing's at least two years old. No, actually, it's just over a year. Just a little over a year. Okay, so in um, my wife had left to go take care of uh, her dad. So she's living down there on the ranch in Arizona, take care of it. And I was leaving. I was like, okay, I've already done the change. I've made it. They can take it from here type thing. And then we started looking at the, the retirement thing, and it's going to sound funny, but when you only got like two and a half years until you can retire again for a second time. Right. So just wait. We're, if, wait. We, if we just stay, this is like one long deployment for us. Right, so it's normal. So we could do two retirements. We have two, two retirements. Two this, two that, so that way we're down there in Arizona with two retirements. Right. And technically, if I take another job there when I'm actually 62, I'd have a third retirement. Right, that's pretty cool. I see so, that happening, by the way. I can see you working because you love, you love it. You thrive in that environment. Right. Right. And so you, we are now four months away. So you're here. 
Yeah. So when did you start the fra your fragrance journey with this with, oh, with all the all the frags? Uh, the first video I posted was September nineteenth last year. Oh, last year. So let's go before that because you had sent to me. Um, it was the big compilation video. Oh yeah. yeah. No, no, I take that back. It was Daraj because right. the big compilation came after that. But I guess for my my actual. But you had said to me that you first got exposed uh, to fragrance watching Jeremy Fragrance, yes. right? Okay, and what year is that? Oh, that's probably back in 2016. Oh, so you're one of his his newer, his older, you were one of the, the, the first original before. to follow him. Yes. And so he exposed you to all these fragrances. Before yeah. then, you would, like, what made you go to Jeremy Fragrance? Man, this is going to sound shallow but i always had fragrances within my life just not at this extent what pushed me girls, into look at girls, yeah. yeah really because i was at That's the point awesome. in my life where i knew that like i don't ever want to get married again but i don't want to grow old alone i still want to have that companionship right. you know that little bit of stability and uh i was looking for a way to try to make myself more attractive to the opposite sex right. And I saw a video that he made that really rang. He said something that really rang true to my ear. He said, dude, this takes zero time to apply and it automatically makes you more attractive because nobody wants to be around somebody that smells bad. You're right. And they want to be about someone who smells, smells good, good, especially being intimate with that yes. person. Yes. So that really rang true. And that's really what kind of sparked the whole awesome. reemergence of really getting involved with fragrances. You know, because through my whole life, I have always had, I was your average user. I had probably five or six bottles, you know, on my dresser. And that was my fragrance wardrobe. You know, now I have enough to where I can probably outfit everybody in the entire town. The whole town <laughs> but hold on. So you're with, you're watching Jeremy Fragrance. What made you decide, like you're watching these videos and so you're watching Jeremy Fragrance. Do you start watching other channels as well? Yeah. Do you become part of these fra fragrance groups? Yeah, I was super, super active on a ton of channels like um, Steve at Red Lessons, okay. Carlos. You know, I will say that the first one you stumble upon is Jeremy because right. he's got a really big channel. If you do any his, search, his pops up. Pops up. Yeah. Pops up. Yeah. If you do online, if you do a search of fragrance on YouTube or wherever, he's going to be the one that pops up. Yes. So, so you're you're watching Jeremy. You you're getting your fragrances. Now, when does your fragrance journey, uh, meaning the fragrance journey, which brought the two of you together? Okay. Well, I'll go backwards because mine is real, real quick. In 1983. <laughs> As a young teenager, I found Javon Musk for men. Okay. At Walgreens or something like that? I, I, it wasn't even Walgreens in Detroit. It was, um, heck, I forget the name of the store. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, yep, got Javon Musk, and I wore that all the way up until April of this year. Seriously? For real. And you never had worn any other I, fragrance? I had sex appeal. Right. Um, which is, which I, is Javon as well? It's Javon okay. as well. And Javon. I had a couple of... You know, oddball ones okay. here and there that that were just kind of thrown in. But for yeah, for my entire life, that's what it that's was. Wild. And everything kind of happened at one time. I quit smoking in April, and for some reason, Lawton had a shortage. There was not a single bottle anywhere in this town of Javon Musk. Seriously, yeah. And so my palate, my nose, my sniffer was out there, and I had to do something. And so I'm. You know, I looked at Aspen. I looked at, at the other ones that I kind of knew. How you know, the Stetson. Bottle, how, how much is a bottle of Javon Musk right now? Ten bucks. Okay. Yeah, you can get it for it's ten, ten dollars. That's amazing. But that was my juice every single day because right. being military, you you become very structured. Right. Yes. So I never walked out of the house with Javon. Well, having everything this the same, everything right. fragrance. I mean, brushing your teeth, you're you're showering, you're doing everything, and um, so I kind of started freaking out and said, "Oh my God." And so I went out and just started sampling and I started finding myself kind of um, addicted to, I wanted something new. And, and so the one bottle became six bottles. Then I found YouTube. I, I've been on YouTube since 2012, just okay. as a, a user. Mm -hmm. Never published anything. And I was just using it for commenting. So I started joining the groups. I was in all these different 
pages and watching all these different reviewers and it became addictive to me to try and break all this stuff apart and what are they smelling and I, I did the same bottle and now I'm trying to smell that and That's awesome. I got hooked on a certain one which was 1821 which is uh, the one that usually the honey, the, shop, the, right? The honey, the honey one, right? right. Yeah. Honey and tobacco. And so I found this this review about 1821, and and the guy, I mean, he's a rough looking dude. He um, does he still have a was, channel now? Yeah, he's he's got a channel, and he was doing a free giveaway, a drawing type um, giveaway for another house was was called Genre. But he was doing this review on 1821. So I subbed to him and I'm like, okay. And so I followed all these videos because you got to go through like six videos to win this drawing. And then you got to come back and put the phrase on the original thing. And so he says, okay, we did the drawing, Russell A. You won it. And I won this drawing. That's amazing. And so I had noticed that, wait a minute, I'm wow. in the same town as this dude. And then it was like two days later, oh, I so get a message. You, you I get a message from, from this rough looking dude <laughs> yeah. that he Three realizes that yeah. we're in Lawton too. Yeah, because I didn't realize he was local. So you did. We so never even knew each other. That's meant to be. Yeah. And so cool. that's how we kind of connected. He was like, well, let's meet up. And I said, yeah, that's cool. Let's meet up. And, um, and now with this brings us to the, almost the present. When was this? Just recently? Like yeah, six months? This was, I mean, you three months back ago. and look on the page. Yeah, to, it was just before we did our first video here. Wow. I mean, probably within a week. Yeah. Because we, we kind of clicked right away. Together, yeah. But let me ask you, now he mentioned Jovan Musk was his, his journey in 78, right? 1977? No, 1983. 83. I was 13 and, and okay. I was just... Okay teenager and I was very attracted to the opposite sex right. and uh, sex appeal was out there and Javon and I think I had both of them in the very beginning. Well and back then to have a bottle say sex appeal that was like almost like taboo right because it said sex on it. Yeah it'd be like effing fabulous. Right exactly so when did your fragrance journey when, when, when the were you first exposed? one that was really started everything off for me was Dakar, Dakar Noir Dakar, by yeah. Yeah, Guy and Gucci. Is that how you yeah, say it? Uh, well, I apologize for killing his name. Love, but, Rochi, love, yeah. I love you. Awesome. Well, <laughs> but that you, was... How would you know? Yeah, that's awesome. That was really it. And then the next one that was a big impact in my life was um, Leckerfield Photo. Yes, which I you can't find too. anymore. I have two tiny little minis up there that I keep for I sentimental. But I can remember being in, in a hair salon and I was getting my hair cut because back then I had hair. And uh, I can remember the really pretty girl that was cutting my hair leaned over and smelled. And she saw, you smell so good. And I, I've been hooked. And that was so. wearing the photo, right? Yeah, that was wearing a photo. No, that's the Jakar. Photo, photo. Jakar. Jakar yes. was, a, was beautiful. It, it, it was probably one of the, you know, you had the polo, but Jakar was like... Cutting edge marketing. You had the boat, the the, the speed boat. I still wear it to this day. My first fragrance <laughs> was Giorgio VIP. I was in high school, and then Chanel poured on the original. Look at this. Unbelievable, huh? You know how much how much how much Drakkar. You know, and then cool water. Do you remember cool water? Mm -hmm. It was what it was one of the first that kind of fragrance where uh fresh right it's one of the original freshies right would you say that it's a what? that's a g.i.t they compare it mostly to g.i.t yeah cool water cool water what well, was actually and aspen aspen cool water oh, that's from aspen, the Jovan collection? And, um no you're talking about cool water, cool water. right Right, and then Aspen, it, those are compared mostly to Creed's Green Irish Tweet. Oh, the Green, okay, the, the, the Creed, can I ask you right. something? Sure. Who distributed, it was Luxury Products. So is this newer bottle? Yeah, it's a newer okay, bottle. Because Luxury Products is the new company that they that distributes. You can always tell by law, you have to put who distributes the fragrance in case something happens and they need to get in touch with them. So right here, Luxury Products LLC, uh, and it says by by designer fragrances Montreal. So this brand, from what I understand, I don't know too much about your car, is owned by a company that's based out of Montreal, and they give the distribution to this company to distribute in the U.S. 
and there's a there's a there's a hundred and I want to say 140 150 markets all over the all over the world and this is the distribution channels when you make a fragrance the distributors take it in the different parts of the world and then they give it to the retailers and they sell it manage it they do all the advertising and they're they're responsible for all of that and so when you have 30 fragrances in your stable there's and imagine how much money that these companies are making because they they have they have you know they're able to economies of scale and right. so they're making anyway so and they handle multiples like right. Cody yeah Cody handles yes so many different lines and I I love the fragrance business it's the same business as like vodka like spirits mm -hmm. it's almost identical they're both uh, they're both alcohol based. And uh, the area, the the um, barriers to entry at that level is very difficult, right? It's very difficult to just come out with a fragrance, unless it's either something you have very niche and you have a clientele. But to do it at that level, you need the resources of that. Yeah. So now you guys are together and you feed off of each other. Yes. And you're like it's really awesome watching you two, and. Uh, I think it was all meant to be the stories you're telling me and how you came together and how you won a bottle by chance in Lawton. I mean, think about it, in Lawton of all places. So what is the, you're here now, you're here for your retirement in two years, you said, so you have right. another two years here. Two more years. And so, and you're here in Lawton. So what is the dream? So I have a feeling that the two of you are going to be together and either grow the channel or, you know, maybe, in the unlikely event, you, you decide we don't want to do this anymore. But I see the two of you together building this channel. Yeah, so do I. I mean, Russ constantly wants to reaffirm that he is my special guest. Right. Russ is, Russ is my partner. Um, I can't see doing this at this point without you because mm -hmm. he's, he's an integral partner intricate part of the channel. People show up to watch us have a conversation. Right. I cherish the moments that I get to spin with somebody that has the same hobby or passion for something like this. So I get to actually talk and have a intellectual conversation with somebody that actually can understand what's going on and is interested. I mean, that's really incredible because you guys could be at the bar Right, you could be playing pool, you could be drinking, you could be, you know, whoring around, whatever. And yet, what's bringing you together is something beautiful like fragrance. Yes. And so, let me ask you this, um, and then I want to shut this down, and then I want to talk about the fragrance part of it with you guys. Okay, sure. that way it's separate. Mm -hmm. um, what? I should shut it down now. So, okay, so you guys, thank you very much for doing this. I, I hope that uh, I hope that people take the time to learn about you, and I hope I enjoyed this. I hope you enjoy it. Yeah. I hope everyone really enjoys it. So thank you so much for uh, coming along with it. Take care. Bye bye. <laughs>